The Giants are reeling a little bit this morning as two of their projected opening day starters, players in that opening day lineup, that is, go down with injuries. So we'll talk about what happened and who's going to fill in and what they might be able to do to upgrade the roster with not a lot of time left before opening day next. You are Locked On Giants, your daily San Francisco Giants podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello and welcome to Locked On Giants, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. My name is Ben Kaspic, and on this show, we provide daily episodes Monday through Friday talking about the San Francisco Giants in a way that's data-driven and rational, but also simple, passionate, and accessible to all. I'm a former contributor for the baseball statistics and analysis websites Beyond the Box Score and Rotographs. I've been podcasting about the Giants since 2015, and I'm a lifelong fan. Thanks for making Locked on Giants your first listen every day. We're free and available on all platforms, including YouTube, so check us out there if you have not already. And coming up on today's show, man, we are going to talk about uh, what a rough day it was yesterday for the Giants on the injury front. I suppose it could have been worse. There's a lot of uh, kind of panic about these injuries, but at the end of the day, neither of them seem to be super serious and long-term, but the Giants Giants lose Evan Longoria to finger surgery and Lamont Wade Jr. to inflammation and a bone bruise in his knee. Both players are going to be reevaluated in about 10 days, and they're not going to do anything between now and then. And so that uh, takes them out of the opening day running, certainly, and they're going to start the season on the injured list, Gabe Kapler just said this morning. So how are the Giants going to fill in for these players? That is the big question of the hour. So I, I want to repeat what I said which is that we're there's maybe a little more panic than there would be otherwise if this happened during the course of the season, simply because we put so much emphasis on that opening day lineup. Both of these players, they're not like the most important players to the Giants, but they did both figure to be an important part of the lineup, certainly against right-handed pitching. And for Longoria, he was an everyday player. Uh, Lamont Wade Jr., more of a platoon player for the Giants. But You know, given that they already lost Posey to retirement and Chris Bryant departs, Donovan Solano departs, a lot of people were already thinking that this uh, offense was going to be worse than it was last year. And I think that's a fair assessment. So then you take out two starting players and most pitchers you're going to face are right-handed. So, uh, you know, weighed an important part of that lineup it's a blow. And when you start thinking about what is this lineup going to look like without those two in it, to me, it's still manageable. Like they have a bunch of interchangeable parts and guys who can play various positions. And so it would allow them in a case like this to kind of put players at the positions where they're needed and put the players who are performing well at those positions. And so right now, to me, it seems like Wilmer Flores is the first guy in line for starts at third base in the absence of Longoria. And in fact, Gabe Kapler kind of verified that this morning, but they also have a lot of other possibilities at that position, which we'll talk about in a minute. But in the outfield, in the place of Lamont Wade Jr., Darren Ruff, he, or excuse me, not Darren Ruff, Steven Duggar, uh, he was someone who looked like probably was going to be ticketed uh, for the minor leagues based on kind of a roster crunch, even with expanded rosters. They have some out-of-options guys like Dubone and Estrada, and that was, to me, going to force Duggar to the minors. But this is why you have depth. It's very important. To me, they're getting thin, though. If there's like like one or two more injuries, then you got a problem. But for now, I think you can still have Jock Peterson in left. You can have Mike Yastrzemski in right, and you can have Steven Duggar in center. So you in some ways you don't miss a beat like Duggar potentially I think there's a good chance not going to give you nearly as much offense as Lamont Wade Jr. but Duggar can impact the game defensively and he can impact the game on the bases and there was upside in the bat uh, uh, last season when he kind of had his best year by far I still have 
big questions about the bat, but you could do a lot, a lot worse than your outfield with a significant injury looking like Peterson, Duggar, and Yastrzemski. I think that that's manageable. And then your bench probably in the outfield is looking like Mauricio Dubon, who would probably be in a platoon with Steven Duggar or Austin Slater or both, kind of Slater platooning with maybe Jock Peterson, or it could be Darren Ruff platooning with Jock Peterson and have Yastrzemski as an everyday guy. Or you could have Estrada in left where he's played some and Slater in center or Dubon in center and Slater in right. There's all kinds of iterations and then that would leave Ruff available to be your DH, or he could play first base. There's just all kinds of possibilities, and that's why I think they can withstand this, and it's not quite as bad as it looks. At third base, they're a little bit thinner. I didn't really love their third base situation as it was. I've been saying for years that I thought the Giants needed to platoon Evan Longoria because he's just consistently not hit right-handed pitching for the last like five years, and kind of at best league average production offensively against righties, but you get the stabilizing defense. But why not bring in a stable defender who can also hit right-handed pitching? I didn't really understand that. Maybe Longoria has just expressed that he really, really doesn't want to be platooned, but at the same time, he's not the one who makes these decisions. So, you know, losing him, let's just let's just get right to the point, though. They lost Longoria for half the year last year, and they didn't miss a beat. Yes, they're a better team with him on it, but we all kind of thought the same thing last year, that they were going to collapse without Longoria, and they really didn't miss a beat. Wilmer Flores, I think, was the main guy to play third base, and there were big questions about his defense. I still have big questions about his defense, but he was able to be passable defensively there and hit enough hit enough to make the loss not that bad. And they've also, you know, they lost Brandon Belt for big chunks of last season, And like I was saying, they were able to move Wade from the outfield to first base along with Darren Ruff, and they mostly didn't miss a beat. And Wilmer Flores can play first. Tommy LaStella can play first. Even Jock Peterson has some experience playing first. And I'm probably even forgetting some other players on this roster who could play first. So I think that they're okay for now, although it is worth thinking about, are there potentially moves to make to make the loss of these players less severe and less damaging. And to me, they are one or two injuries or significant regression uh, from last year away from having a problem and needing to kind of make a move out of uh, necessity. So coming up in a minute, we're going to talk about what the possibilities are for the Giants to maybe look outside the organization, trade possibilities ranging from relatively lesser known players to some veteran players who are kind of interesting to a huge splash that the Giants could make and someone that I think a lot of people are thinking about today. So stay tuned for that conversation. But first, our next partner has a product that I literally use every day. I started taking Athletic Greens because I wanted a supplement that actually tastes great, unlike so many other options out there. With one delicious scoop of of Athletic Greens, greens, you're absorbing 75 high-quality vitamins, minerals, whole food-sourced superfoods, probiotics, and adaptogens to help you start your day right. This special blend of ingredients supports your gut health, your nervous system, your immune system, your energy recovery focus, and aging. All of the things, pretty much, is what I'm saying. It's also lifestyle-friendly, important to me, whether you're keto, paleo, vegan, dairy-free or gluten-free, and it costs less than $3 a day. You're investing in your health, and it's cheaper than that cold brew habit that I know I have. So right now, it's time to reclaim your health and arm your immune system with convenient daily nutrition, especially heading into cold and flu season. It's just one scoop in a cup of water every day. That's it. No more need for a million different pills and supplements to look out for your health. To make it easy, Athletic Greens is going to give you a free one-year supply of immune-supporting vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. All you have to do is visit athleticgreens.com slash MLB network. That's athleticgreens.com slash MLB network to take ownership of your health and pick up the ultimate daily nutritional insurance. 
All right. As promised, we are going to discuss the possible kind of outside the organization moves the Giants could make here to address these injuries. Like I said, I think that they're possibly one blow away from having a problem and kind of being forced to make a move. And that's not really a position they like to find themselves in. And so is there a move to make now, especially as teams are kind of trimming their rosters in preparation of opening day? Are there some expendable players? Thanks again for making Locked on Giants your first listen every day. Locked on MLB Prospects host Lindsey Crosby is a prospect encyclopedia, and he's going deep on the MLB stars of tomorrow. It's free and available wherever you get podcasts. And speaking of the MLB stars of tomorrow, a lot of people are thinking about Cleveland's Jose Ramirez. We did a podcast largely about him just a few days ago and the possibility of a trade there, and that was when Longoria was presumably healthy. And so to me, I mean, uh, Jose Ramirez would solve many problems at once for the San Francisco Giants. He solves the long-term outlook at third base with Evan Longoria entering the last guaranteed year of his deal. He signs or he addresses the issue of the Giants maybe taking a step back offensively, losing Posey and Bryant and Solano. I think that they're going to be okay, but certainly you add a Jose Ramirez, you're adding a top five player in the game to the middle of your lineup. Adds value defensively on the bases, offense, offensively switch hitter, good from both sides of the plate. He, I think he's my favorite player, and he has been for a while. So, man, would he solve a lot of issues for the Giants. And, I mean, switch hitter, like I said, so all of the platooning, this would be a true everyday guy. And he's under club control for two seasons, uh, with two club options. Obviously, this one was already picked up, but they're pretty cheap. It's roughly $20 million over the next two years, which is a huge bargain. He's worth way more than $20 million per year, and that's what he costs for two years. So the issue is I don't think Cleveland is looking to trade him right now, and even if they were, it would cost a lot. Right at the time of this recording, there's a debate going on on Twitter about what it would cost for the Giants uh, to get Jose... Ramirez. And for me, it would cost a lot at this point. On the podcast a few days ago, when we talked about what it would take to get him, first of all, I felt like I undersold it a little bit, comparing him and and a possible trade to what uh, Francisco Lindor commanded in a trade with Cleveland. It's, it's a little bit of a different case. And I forgot that Carlos Carrasco was a part of the deal. And so that kind of influenced the return. And also, it was just one year of Lindor at that point. And right now, we're looking at two years. And in that podcast last week, I was talking about getting Ramirez maybe at the end of July and possibly even a couple months later next offseason. If you're looking at right now getting two full years of Ramirez, that's a big difference than one year of Ramirez. And so it would cost a lot. You're talking about Marco Luciano plus maybe Kyle Harrison plus maybe another player or Luis Matos and Kyle Harrison and another player. It would not be cheap. You're not going to just get this guy from Cleveland for cheap. He is that good, that affordable. The cost doesn't really matter to the Giants. It shouldn't, but it matters to some teams. And so uh, there would be huge demand, huge. Every team in baseball should be all over this if he was made available. And for me, it would make the most sense if you felt like you could and would extend him in addition. Similar to, you know, the Dodgers acquiring Mookie Betts and then extending him. So, yeah, in a perfect world, I do believe personally that I would really strongly consider moving a package like that for Jose Ramirez. It would be tough to swallow, and I don't think they're going to make a move like that out of panic, especially when we're talking about potentially short-ish term injuries. For Longoria, by the way, I'm sure you've read about this, maybe not. Uh, It's a surgery to repair a ligament in his right index finger. It was an injury he sustained last year, uh, but apparently he th- they all thought it was going to be fine and, that it, and then it cropped up again this spring. He had yet to appear in a spring game, but he was uh, hitting in simulated games and they thought he was going to be ready for opening day. Uh, his finger will be immobilized for at least 10 days post-surgery, and then he's going to be reevaluated. And I think they're going to have a better prognosis about how long to expect him to be out once the surgery is done. So the surgery is going to be done today. So we're going to probably hear about that later today, if not tomorrow. 
And then for Lamont Wade, as I said, it is uh, inflammation and a bone bruise. I think it's his right knee, not that it necessarily really makes a big difference which knee it is. But yeah, so I don't think they're going to make a big panic reactionary move like, okay, we weren't going to get Jose Ramirez, but now we are because Longoria is going to have his finger immobilized for 10 days, especially when the next 10 days are like the days leading up to opening day. So he might be he might be able to start baseball activity again in 10 days, which is like maybe he would only miss 10 days or two weeks. So until we have a clearer timetable, I'm not going to hit the panic button. And I'm just going to look at some other possible options that aren't so extreme. I do think they should be in on Ramirez, but I also don't think Cleveland is selling him yet. I think that they want to see how the season plays out. They're rebranding as the Guardians and I have it on good authority that they don't want to move him right now. They are trying to extend him. We'll see if that comes to fruition. But uh, I just don't think that this is very likely at all. I would be thrilled if it happened, but it would cost a lot. The prospect prospects you give up would look like a lot, and fans would – it would be a lot to stomach, but you'd be getting a great player. But I don't think it's likely. Anyway, the other options – doesn't feel great baby on Twitter and Wyatt on Twitter threw out some names that I thought were solid names. Um, Jake Lamb and Tony Kemp thrown out by doesn't feel great baby. I think that both of those are kind of solid. Wouldn't cost too much veteran left-handed infielders. I do. I am intrigued by Jake Lamb. He used to be a really good player. He's currently in the Dodgers organization, but Doubtful to me that he makes that opening day roster. I'm not entirely sure what the outlook is for him there. He's undergone some swing changes. If you look at video of him right now, he looks completely different at the plate to me. And so he's the type of guy that might be taking, worth taking a flyer on and that there would be little risk. If it doesn't work out, it would be easy to move on. And if it does work out, great. You've got a useful veteran player with a track record of having some productive seasons and some really productive seasons with Arizona in the past. And then Wyatt threw out some names, uh, Christian Arroyo, Cole Tucker, and Nick Solak. I'm not sure I'm in love with any of those players. Nick Solak, I was looking him up. I think there's a lot of promise in the bat, but it hasn't really come to fruition except maybe as a, a weak side of a platoon player. Christian Arroyo, I have a soft spot for because, you know, obviously he was with the Giants for many years as one of their top prospects, and they... They traded him in the Longoria deal, right? And so that would kind of be poetic justice. That's not really the right phrase, but it would kind of be fitting uh, to bring in Christian Arroyo to replace Evan Longoria uh, and this injury. So the thing about Arroyo is he probably is expendable without knowing like the intimate details of the Red Sox roster because they went out and got Trevor Story. It looked like Arroyo was probably going to slot in as their second baseman, and then they went and get they went out and got Trevor Story. And so Arroyo is going to be sitting on the bench. Uh, Fangraphs is listing him as a platoon, uh, weak side of a platoon player, so maybe he's platooning with Alex Verdugo in left field. I'm not entirely sure what the plan is there, but he could probably be pried away. He's out of minor league options, and so... Could be, you know, a a move that could make sense for the Red Sox who don't necessarily want to have to roster him and the Giants might be able to get him by trading them somebody who's roughly equal in value but has some options and so it gives the Red Sox more flexibility. So that's a possibility. Those are just some names to look out for. Mike Moustakis, this would be a salary dump. He is owed a lot of money by the Cincinnati Reds. I'm sure they would be thrilled to move that contract to any degree. He's owed uh, 16 million in 2022 and 18 million in 2023. So that's $34 million over two years. He's worth almost none of that right now. His production has really fallen off, but he can move around. He's played some second, he's played some third, and he's a veteran, but you would either have to have the Reds attach a really good prospect, attach a really good player like uh, Luis Castillo or Tyler Malley. And I'm, I don't think the Giants really have room for that right now in their starting rotation. So I don't know that I see that happening. I don't know that I see the Reds attaching a good prospect. Nick Senzel, he's not really a prospect anymore, but there's just, uh, he's a guy to 
I don't know. It's a possibility, but certainly the Giants aren't just going to take on all of that salary. There would have to be something done there. So anyway, coming up next, I want to shift our attention and talk about opening day starting pitcher, Logan Webb. The Giants announced that Webb is going to get that start for the Giants. So what is the rare company that Webb finds himself in? We'll talk about it in just a minute. All right. As promised, we are going to get into, you know, shifting gears. One more name, though, Michael Conforto. I, did, I meant to mention him as well as, you know, a player who could make sense given these injuries. Michael Conforto is still out there in free agency. Uh, once again, though, I don't know that they're going to make a big reactionary move to Lamont Wayne Jr. having some swelling in his knee and a bone bruise. It'd be one thing if his leg snapped in half and he was going to miss the whole season. But we're talking about a bone bruise. And he's a platoon player. So I, I don't know. If they didn't plan on signing Michael Conforto before, I don't think that this makes them go out there and sign a Michael Conforto. Those names I just mentioned as possible replacements, Jake Lamb, Jose Ramirez, and on and on, those were just third basemen. I haven't had a chance to look at the outfielders yet because this injury just happened right before we started recording with Wade. At least we found out about it, what the specifics of it were. But we can do that maybe tomorrow talk about some possible replacements besides Conforto. But Conforto is still out there. I still think he makes some sense for the Giants. It remains to be seen if they're even interested. And it, it here's the other thing. He hasn't signed yet. And so if you sign him, he's going to require some time to get ready for opening day or to get ready to play in a major league game anyway. So he might miss as much time as Lamont Wade Jr. misses. So that kind of makes that potentially not make so much sense. But let's talk for a minute about Logan Webb. I just want to kind of tip my hat to him and uh, say congratulations for being named the opening day starter. It is a pretty big honor for a pitcher to be an opening day starter. And for Webb, I mean, last year, he wasn't really even guaranteed a job going into the season. He had this breakout year, ends up with a 303 ERA in about 150 innings and just dealing in the postseason twice against the Dodgers. Dominant, dominant stuff for Logan Webb in the postseason there and just really in the ever since like May rolled around he had what was it 15 straight starts two runs or fewer which was a record for either the Giants or in the history of baseball something like that he had a fabulous breakout season and he's just 25 years old and he's going to get the start on opening day I really do believe that the San Francisco Giants rotation has a shot to be one of the very best in baseball as disappointed as some of us are about kind of what they did on the offensive side this offseason, I think that we should pretty much be equally impressed with how they built this rotation that started with just Logan Webb into one that looks like one of the best in baseball, potentially. So he's going to get that start. And the rare company that he finds himself in, I just wanted to mention that he's one of uh, only four pitchers, homegrown Giants starters to have four or more Fangraphs wins above replacement seasons in the last 20 years, joining Madison Bumgarner, Matt Cain, and Tim Lincecum. Only seven total pitchers have accomplished that feat in the last 20 years. And so it's fitting that now Webb joins those three homegrown Giants on the list of, of homegrown opening day starters for the Giants. And to do it at the age of, what did I say, 25? 20, 25 is just a great uh, opportunity for him and a great uh, accomplishment for him and Logan Webb under club control through the 2025 season. So 22, 3, 4, 5, 4 more years of club control for Logan Webb. So he's going to be here a while. Definitely more chances to start on opening day in the future. So that is all the time we have for today. Thanks again for making Locked on Giants your first listen every day. Now make your second listen Locked on MLB. Paul Francis Sullivan, please call him Sully, brings you his unique perspective on the majors, past and present. It's free and available wherever you get podcasts. Once again, my name is Ben Kaspik. Check me out on Twitter at Ben Kaspik, K-A-S-P-I-C-K. If you like this show, please consider rating it or leaving a review. It helps me out so much. So thank you in advance and thank you to everyone who's done so already. I can't wait to be with you again tomorrow talking about the latest and talking about possible replacement outfielders for Lamont Wade Jr., so thanks again for listening. Stay locked on Giants.